Welcome back to another DFM case study. I'm Chris Gamble and I run the Supply Frame Hardware blog. Today we're going to be going over the K-Box again, which is uh, what we talked to Toma Sarlandi, Sarlandi about last time. Uh, that was uh, me and him chatted about what was going on with this open source project. And today we're going to take a look at some of the uh, build material elements and the actual design files and see if we can't find some more optimizations as we move forward kind of moving this thing into production more than it already is, right? It's already at the prototype stage. He's having it manufactured at Macrofab. But now we're going to try and see what else we can do for it in terms of sourcing components, finding new assembly houses, uh, and really optimizing the design for other uh, efficiencies, maybe even changing the design. So let's take a quick look over at the design files. There we go. Uh, so, like I said, this is an open source project. So, on the right side here, we do have Tomas' uh, GitHub repo, which is showing all the hardware files. I've already cloned that, and since it is uh, KiCad as well, uh, I'm able to just use the open source software here on the left side. This is uh, this is a eCAD program. There's no reason that you couldn't clone the files if it was another program like Eagle or Altium Designer or anything like that. But I just happen to have the files uh, open here, so that's that's helpful. Instead of just looking at a PDF, we can actually look at the schematic. So let's do that now. Oh, there's some library issues. Aha, he used an older version of KiCad, so there is that. Okay, there we go. So the first thing I'm going to do is just take a look at how he actually stored the device information in here. All right, so I'm going to mouse over hit E. Oh, sorry, this is actually the sheet. So we can enter the sheet by double clicking. And then things like this, the MK20. So he stored the part number here. Looks like he has a uh, separate field for part number. Looks like let's see if that's yep. So that is that is uh, consistent across his his parts and stuff like that. So let's also go back to the design files and see if we have other things. So we have bomb substitutions here, but I don't see other. Uh, files for oh okay so he probably uploaded the entire uh, design file to Macrofab so we're need to we're going to need to go and generate a bill of material here let's see if we can do that okay we got kbox.csv I'll open that up over here kbox.csv There it is. So we're going to have to import this into LibreOffice. Looks like things are separated by spaces here, which is not a great way to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't want to do it by space. Sorry, that is grouped into, uh, I see. So this is just one column. Yeah, so there's 23 parts here. There's the, uh, the number. And then do we have, looks like we do, great. All right, so we have a bomb output here. So we have reference, quantity, value, footprint, data sheet, and part number. And part number is the one we really care about because that's ultimately what we're gonna put into a program that allows us to you know, analyze the bill of material. And these are, Looking at just the capacitor names, right? So this is a 0603 capacitor, but this uh, looks like a actual manufacturing part number, which is what we want to do here. Okay, so let's go and put this into a tool that I know pretty well. It's called Fine Chips Pro. It is a supply frame tool. There's other tools out there like it, but this is a bomb analysis tool, so we can actually see if we're getting good pricing on this stuff. So I'm going to load this up into Fine Chips here. Uh, Functions Pro, rather. Uh, if you don't have it already, you can go register for a free account. Uh, it's good for 30 days. So I'm going to go upload bomb and then go kbox.csv. You see it does actually pull in the uh, part number column. It does recognize the part number column here and then the number of qu the quantity here. So and then we can select over here uh, bomb quantity. I'm going to put this at 100 actually just because we're kind of moving towards a, uh, you know, when we're talking about having uh, larger, a larger manufacturing run, 
a hundred is probably a, a good number. I mean, obviously, at the at the cost we were talking about Tama with, that would be a significant investment as well. So that was a one hundred and seventy five dollars per unit, at, but at a hundred, so that's you know getting up there. It's like seventeen thousand dollars, right? So uh, yeah, so it can get up there, but you know that is kind of the that's the whole reason for doing a. Uh, really, that's the whole reason for doing this in the first place. So, anyways, let's go and say save list. And then it's going to go through and actually do some analysis on each of these components, make sure that each of them is the right part number. If something comes up, it usually means it is the right or is it is a correct part number. And that's the important thing here. We want to make sure that we are actually we have the correct part numbers in our schematic. That's another piece of DFM. This would happen at almost any online thing you go to, you're going to have, you know, a, a, you know, if you go to a macrofab or a, a, a PCBNG or anything like that, any of these online things, if you don't have the right part number, it's not going to it's not going to do anything for you. So uh, looks like we're going through trying to find different distributors here. We have uh, Mauser, Vericle, DigiKey, Chip One Stop. So there are a, a range of things here. And what we might try and do it as well is get them all from the same distributor uh, from a, a convenience standpoint, right? So especially a lot of these things that are um, standbys here, we might want to just go uh, pull them all from the same part family or something like that, right? So these you see CC0603, CC0603, uh, GRM188, 188, uh, you know, all these different parts are different manufacturers as well, so we could try and also con combine parts to get, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of efficiency there. So right now we're at about $19 in parts. I'm guessing once we get to the, uh, you know, that one, that one was a, mi a miss, it looks like. Um, but once we get down to the, yeah, like here we go, WS2812, no match found, no match found. Uh, ESP looks like we do actually have that one, so that's good. Um, but things like the Teensy, yeah, the bootloader, that's going to be something where we don't actually have that there. And that was another $7. So do we have them all? Looks like we have them all. Okay, so we're at $33. That's a good start. Uh, what else can we see with this here? So a uh, number of distributors we have going on here. Um, and uh, we can also take a look at uh, this dialog here, the parts that need attention, right? So this is just showing the ones that were, weren't found. This is obviously a, a bum one here. This is this is something we talked about with Toma, actually moving this from a WS2812. This would actually be a design change, right? So we could source these, uh, what are called NeoPixels, um, or we could uh, you know source them separately. Same thing here, the Teensy bootloader. This is actually bought from PJRC.com, which is about a $7 part. So let's see what happens now. If, uh, let's we, I guess we could just up it as well. I mean... Well, maybe we should go the other direction, right? Uh, so $33 in quantities of 100, we can then go and requote re it at uh, quantity 10, right? Because that's actually going to be probably a different price then. Uh, we're going to see different um, different volume breaks, stuff like that, uh, especially in the more advanced parts, right? For capacitors, for capacitors and resistors, that kind of stuff's not really going to matter that much, right? We're going to see small changes because anything with cut tape like that, it's going to be... Uh, not that big a deal. Now, also something to think about with a lot of these components is if we're sending it off to an assembly house, they're going to either have to use in-house components, right? So Toma talked about using in-house uh, macrofab parts where the parts are already ro loaded onto the reels, or they're going to have to go and do something like a digi reel or a mauser reel where they take the components, right? So they might take 100 components and re-reel them. Otherwise, what you have to do is you have to go and buy an entire reel of components. And so if you need 10, 10 capacitors out of a reel of 5,000, it's not going to be much in uh, money terms, right? You're not going to have it's the whole reel is going to cost about six bucks or something like that. But at the same time, in a, in a percentage of uh, waste, that's a lot of parts that are not getting used. So there might be also some considerations for trying to condense down. So maybe instead of you know uh, using a, a one microfarad capacitor, it might be worthwhile. Probably not, but it might be worthwhile to use 10.1 microfarad capacitors, right? And and getting them all together now. That obviously takes a lot more room, so there's kind of these design trade-offs there, but just something to think about. So let's go back over here, see what we got. Uh, so these are still all of the needs attention. So we X out of that, we can see what well, we were at 33 before, and now 40, uh, 42. So what we see is we see about an eight dollar difference simply from uh, the quantity difference, quantity breaks, right? So uh, two parts don't match stock. Okay. Now the other thing to note here is that we have so for a uh, low run like this. We're actually going with 
a lot of different distributors here, right? So what we'd also want to do is maybe check out the settings so that we uh, so we do preferred distributors first, right? So what I can do is go and set the preferred distributors, right? So I could say something like, I just want to do, uh, since I think Toma actually designed this with DigiKey in mind, I'm just going to do DigiKey and then I'll have a secondary as Mauser, right? So I'm going to do that and then we'll do preferred distributors only and then we'll, uh, yeah. Let's go and refresh that list one more time here. Uh, now what's going to happen probably is that the, the cost will probably go up because now we're going to have fewer distributors, so we're not going to be able to optimize on price for each and every component. Now, that might also be that you see, you're seeing optimization on things like capacitors where net-net uh, is not going to actually make that much difference. But in this case, uh, you know, we're trying to actually optimize for fewer shipments because that's another thing Tomat talked about is, well, each time you process an order through a different distributor, you also have this added shipping surcharge, not to mention the human cost of handling all these different parts, right? So now you have 10 distributor orders coming in. If you're making a thousand of something or a million of something, that is totally worth it, right? You're really making that up in the volume, right? So the handling stuff is not a big deal. You're just trying to optimize for price. In a low volume situation like this, really the, each handling cost it goes up and up and up and up uh, each time you switch to a different distributor. So this might be something where you use a tool like this to optimize down to just a subset of distributors. Now also I should mention that I, well, I, think I, did, I did mention that Toma probably designed this with DigiKey in mind. I think he, he did mention that. So uh, something to keep in mind here, right? Obviously that's going to also hit our pricing, right? So let's take a look at what actually came up here. So now we see that it did go up again, not by much, only $4 that time. But in this case, we're, you know, we're only going to two distributors now, but uh, it looks like Mauser actually has a, a, a wider range of them. Uh, you do see that things like, uh, but now we actually don't have the ESP, right? So that was listed with, uh, I think, yeah, TME actually carries it, uh, but no one else actually has that specific part number. Now, if you remember from Tomaz's analysis, he actually showed that he was uh, he was ordering this and then sourcing it and sending it to his assembler, which, which is Macrofab. So that is another consideration there. So in this case, we actually can go in and say, yes, we do want to confirm the change on this one. We do want to actually add in a third distributor. But in this case, uh, so like this one here, right? we just see there's, there's nothing found. There's nothing in the, the system because you actually have to go to pjrc.com and order directly from Paul, who makes that, that teensy. Uh, it's basically, it's, a, it's the same as... Uh, it's actually a smaller version of the uh, part. Actually, we can just go back to the schematic. Another benefit of having it here. So this is the, uh, so you see it is, it is an NKL02 uh, uh, part, right? That actually is the part number, or sorry, that is the value of the, of the part, right? So if we could go and buy this part, but it won't actually have the bootloader burned onto it, right? So this is a pre-programmed part. So all these things are actually architectural decisions that we would need to go and take a look at if, uh, you know, so say we wanted to, maybe we just go and pre-program this MK20, which is the part that this bootloader is loading. Now he does it, uh, if you go and watch, if you go and watch that talk that he did, which is located over on our uh, Medium blog. So this is the, uh, we'll try and link this down below as well. Uh, so this is the talk he had given initially that kind of spurred this uh, discussion in the first place. But in, throughout this, he actually talks about why, uh, why he's doing what he's doing in the design side of things. So this is just a broader discussion as well about, well, do we want to actually go and replace something like this bootloader component because there might be additional costs that are, that are hidden in labor or in, um, you know, flexibility, right? So again, this is, you know, this is this is a device that is very low volume. Uh, it likely is to stay low volume, but we're kind of weighing the benefits of, well, do we want to take this to a higher volume production? And then, if we were going to do that, what would actually need to happen from a design perspective? So let's uh, take one more look here. So uh, let's see where did I put it? All right, here we go. <laughs> Tabs. Uh, okay, so uh, like I said, we. Uh, oh, this price went up as well because of the we added in that uh, that ESP. All right, so um, what we've been taking a look at here is is basically you know uh, Tomas estimates, uh, which were kind of all part of all these estimates were part of sourcing and the decision of what, you know can we get any kind of benefit here from uh, going to different distributors. Looks like we could get about you know five to ten dollars benefit just from 
optimizing between distributors, right? We go to a wider range of distributors. We could get a little bit more. Obviously, we get more if we change the quantity here as well. That would be that's obviously going to be the biggest difference. Up your quantities, you're going to start to uh, really see some savings in terms of a, a per unit cost. Now, the real thing though is that if we look back over here. Um, looks like there was some optimization on that end from Macrofab. They actually have all the parts included in here, right? He has his batch costs uh, in his analysis. But uh, the real thing to think about is, oh, sorry, it's down here. Um, the real thing to think about is that there's a significant other set of costs here, which is manufacturing, assembly, and then uh, the mechanical components as well. So all of these things together uh, really start to, to add up. Uh, if we take a, so let's see, if we, if we take uh, this, What's the value here? E10, right? So if we if we take E10 as a uh, as a fraction of, so that's only 30% of the total cost, right? So 30% of the total cost is the components themselves, so the PCB components. So there is definitely a lot of other other um, other optimizations we can do, and other things we are going to talk about here in the future, right? So. Any kind of DFM activity is not simply about parts. Obviously, I'm showing a tool here that is just kind of obviously checking your work, especially if you're sourcing higher amounts of components. I think FineShift Pro is a great way to do that. But in this case, we're going to also have to take a look at mechanical assembly, maybe getting quotes from other assemblers and stuff like that, and then all the shipping stuff. So it's really about optimizing each thing, trying to knock down each tall pole until you start to get a higher uh, or a better, a better price for your final output. Like I mentioned, you know, ultimately the best thing in this case is going to be, well, if you could sell 100 of them versus, or if you could buy 100 at a time, that obviously gets the cost down. And that's going to be the same case for assembly and mechanical and everything else too. So thanks for watching. Uh, we are enjoying, this is an enjoyable thing for, for me personally for taking a look at the, the DFM aspects of a, a, a product like this, right? This is a, a fledgling product. It's open source. So that very much helps the discussion around it. Um, I think that Tomas is interested in discussing other uh, changes that might happen that, that could ultimately lower the cost and optimize the product, uh, especially on the mechanical side. It seems like that's going to be a big piece here. But we'll continue to take a look at it here. So thanks for watching and uh, thanks for reading the Supply Frame Hardware blog.